um, and welcome uh, to this session. So if you're here, um, we hope you're here to, uh, for the CWE seminar tools for valuing ecosystems and nature-based solutions. Uh, if you're not here for that, we still welcome you uh, and we'd like to you to stick around. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting session, lots of content. Uh, looking forward to, to, um, to all of, of, the, um, of the presentations and the discussion. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, um, we will be doing any Q&A and exchanges through uh, the chat feature on Pathable. Uh, so it, the same the same location where you joined this meeting has a chat feature and we'll do all the exchanges there. The chat feature in Zoom is going to be disabled for for speakers so that so so if you need, need to make any common questions, suggestions, please do that through Pathable. Second, we have um, translation in this session uh, between English and Spanish um, and um, and that's also uh, available um, uh, through through the platform. Um, um, and um, um, the program uh, and all the uh, all the files presentations uh, have been uploaded on the Pathable platform and are accessible for download. So you know presentations and 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 other documents are there for you to for you to have. And and of course the session is being recorded. Um, so with that said, um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Fernando Miralles Wilhelm. Um, I'm a lead scientist with the Nature Conservancy, um, and I also moonlight as a professor of hydrology at George Mason University in Virginia in the United States. Uh, um, it's my pleasure to be here in this session, um, and uh, I'll introduce um, uh, our um, our real host for this session, uh, which is my dear friend and colleague, Sergio Campos, um, chief of, of the Water and Sanitation Division at the Inter-American Development Bank. Sergio, welcome. Thank you very much, Fernando. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, on behalf of all the conveners, including the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, the Foundation, Rain Matter Foundation, the Inter-American Development Bank, and uh, CWE, I welcome all of you to this seminar, Tools for Valuating Ecosystems and Nature-Based Solutions. According to Swiss Re, one of the world's largest insurance providers, climate change could cut the world's economy by 23 trillion, 23 trillion by 2050. That is more than the GDP of all Europe. That is more than the GDP of the United States. Climate change will impact us all, but particularly developing countries. Yet, in many cases, our governance requires that we value ecosystems and uh, the visibility of nature-based solutions by estimating the amount of money that people are willing to pay to preserve or enhance uh, the services. Given the importance of the ecosystems to adapt, mitigate the effects of climate change, and in particular, given the findings that the most recent IPCC report highlights in which some of the effects are not reversible, Shouldn't we, shouldn't we explore in different mechanisms to value our ecosystems and our nature-based solutions? Uh, under this con context, this seminar will pursue three, three objectives. First, to learn about cutting edge ways to value our ecosystems and showcase five case studies. And that is in this session. In the second session, uh, out of the three of this seminar, we're going to focus on learning about uh, the challenges and solutions of implementing nature-based solutions and valuation of, of the ecosystem services. Uh, and in our third session, uh, we will highlight key elements uh, and the way forward. Uh, now, I'll, I'm, uh, Fernando has already introduced himself. Uh, I'll give the floor to him, but to those that join later, uh, Fernando, a great friend and, and, and esteemed colleague, uh, is agreed to moderate this, this session, Dr. Fernando Miraez, is currently, currently serves as a professor and dean of the College of Science of George Mason University in Virginia and has appointments as a lead scientist for fresh water and the Nature Conservancy and serve and as the senior research and advisor of NASA and headquarters in Washington. Fernando, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Sergio. Um, um, I'm trying to share my screen and for some reason it's disabled. So maybe someone from Oh, so that's why, because you're going to do it. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Yes. So, so um, first and foremost, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for the opportunity uh, uh, to uh, be here with you today. Uh, uh, World Water Week. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an event very close and dear to my heart. I've met um, and connected with so many uh, people and institutions over the years, um, and it is, it is the, the, the event to be in terms of water every year. So I'm happy to be here. And um, what I want to talk to you today about is. Um, um, is nature-based solutions in the water space. And this is a very, very large topic, very, very challenging. So I try, to, I, I try to narrow down a little bit of the discussion by looking at providing food, water, and energy to people while taking action for climate and ecosystems. And I, I underlined the word food um, um, because um, it's no surprise, even though this is a session on water and this is a, actually a whole event around water, um, Producing food is the major uh, is the major way we use water worldwide. Moreover, producing food is the way humans alter the every single ecosystems. Every single uh, the the biggest footprint of humans in the world is to produce food. It is the biggest way we impact our environment. Um, and every time I'm asked, so how do we how do we solve the water problem in the world? In order to fix water, you got to fix food. I mean, that's it. If you want to fix climate, you have to fix food. If you want to fix ecosystems, you have to fix food. Okay. Um, and uh, so at the Nature Conservancy, um, you know, we've taken an, an agenda where we actually integrate uh, food and, and water and the provision of these two, particularly. Uh, energy is also there because the, the, the way we produce energy is also tied to um, uh, to water and to land, particularly, um, and uh, uh, so it, it sort of it sort of comes uh, energy comes in in the package when we look at food and water. But these two are actually uh, tight, uh, very tight at the at the sort of joined tightly at the hip. So can we go next? Um, so 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 why are we doing this? And um, uh, let's click one more time uh, just to give you give you a sense of um, you know despite. This, you know, despite progress, and here, you know, you have, um, um, you know, it's a graph, it's a, it's a little bit inspired um, by um, um, some graphics produced um, by the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. But if you, if you look at how um, nature has been sort of deteriorating over the years, right, we, if we look at that historical period, you know, biodiversity is going down, water quality is going down, land degradation is going down, Atmospheric quality is going down. Climate change is increasing. So every 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 single indicator of environmental quality, it's deteriorating. Um, and uh, and nature is really the key to sort of get back on track. And we can actually uh, approach this through a number of trajectories. And 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 this number of trajectories or scenarios is what the whole climate change movement and climate change. Uh, um, process and at the United Nations and the countries has been inspired, right? So try to try to envision a future or try to envision a series of futures and, and, and try to see how you get there. But nature is increasingly becoming an important factor in achieving these, this, you know, these possible futures. And, and we can envision at least three, like in, in this graph, you know, one where you sort of continue going down, you know, business as usual. And, and then, you know, uh, you know, that, whatever is going on now is only going to get worse, right? So that's one trajectory. Another trajectory with the, the, where you try to stabilize, you know, sort of a, sort of stop the deterioration and stabilize. Um, and that is that sort of the yellow, that yellow intermediate path in there. And then there's the greener path where you're actually not only able to stop the deterioration, stabilize it, but actually start improving things again. And that's, so hopefully that is the path that we, you know, we, we wish to follow uh, next, um, and uh, so so the the whole notion is that we can actually grow positive, right? There is there is a way to grow that does not deteriorate. This um, situation that I was just describing, where the biggest the biggest footprint that we have uh, around the world is to produce our food, that can be reversed. You can actually grow and you know and and have and thriving ecosystems, have thriving water systems, have thriving food systems, improve climate conditions, have thriving ecosystems. That is that is the desired path, it is possible. And there are there are some indications that this can be done. So let's go next. Let me give you a little bit of, um, uh, so this is a study that um, 
the Nature Conservancy uh, and did jointly with the uh, with FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, uh, to try to understand, uh, you know, how do how do we implement uh, nature-based solutions in, in agriculture? And that's again tackling the big the big elephant in the room, tackling how we produce our food using nature-based solutions. And um, if if you look at you know this sort of the, this sort of the, these two axes where where you have um, um, a, a level of ecosystem change on the horizontal axis and the level of ecological complexity, you know, on the on the high end, you know, you have um, low ecological complexity, uh, lots of you know lots of systems transform, and that tends to be created creating system. This is what you know if you look at constructed wetlands; these are artificial systems that we can create. On the low, on the on the left end and up, um, you have systems that have lots of complexity, very little intervention. Those are the pristine systems. We want to hold on to those. But in the middle space, we have the majority of, of the systems that we can manage. So those are the, the, the managed systems we ha which have a moderate level of complexity, moderate level of interventions. Next. Um, and then if you actually zoom on those, um, going back, um, you can look at uh, the space where you can implement nature-based solutions. Um, and uh, in, in the study that we did with FAO, we, we look at NBS in sort of two, in two big compartments. One is uh, nature-based solutions in agricultural landscapes. So these are nature-based solutions that can be implemented in landscapes that are used to produce food currently, right? Um, and then there's NBS in agricultural production. So this is in the food producing systems themselves. This is agriculture farmers. This is industry that produces food. What are nature-based solutions that can be implemented there? So we try to make a survey and try to get an assessment of um, how, um, you know, how, how is this going to all add up? So can we go next? Um, and, um, you know, you can get at least, uh, you know, triple benefit from MBS based on our review of um, case studies, literature, and, and uh um, and some analysis that we did in terms of investments and, and in terms of gaps in investment. Um, you can get at least a triple benefit. You can get resilient food production. Um, and uh, so you can put, produce food in a resilient way, not only for the food production itself, so make the food production robust so they can resist um, a change, but also make the ecosystem that renders the services that allows us to produce those uh, that food resilient. So that's one one package of benefits. You can at the same time mitigate climate change, um, um, and um, so nature-based solutions uh, are are increasingly being studied and used towards tackling climate change. And and at, and at the same time, in all this process, you can enhance a nature and biodiversity. There is there is there is not necessarily the choice of either or we need to approach this as going it all in together. Uh, that is both daunting and it's a challenge, but it's it, it's really the only way we have to go because all the all the other trajectories we tried uh, have, have resulted in uh, in the in the degrade, degradation of, of the entire systems. And you know as, as time progresses, our ecosystems are worse, our food gets worse, right? Um, and um, and uh, so we need to really go back to that. Next. Um, so we looked at a variety of nature-based solutions applied both in agricultural landscapes and agricultural production. This uh, this slide is uh, tackles the 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 uh, nature-based solutions that can be implemented by the producers of food, the farmers and the the producer. And and you can actually get you know by just surveying the literature and trying to understand uh, what's been done, what has been documented, um, what has been vetted, right? Uh, you can you can get uh, you can get some interesting findings. You know, for instance, um, um, you can get very positive benefit cost ratios in terms of the investments in, in nature based solutions. Uh, and uh, in, in 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 this case, um, uh, improvements in water quality. So if you if you can save in water treatment by using nature based solutions, um, you know this can be very positive. You can certainly improve in mitigating um, emissions of carbon to the atmosphere and mitigate climate change uh, uh, in, in, along several of these. Um, um, you can mitigate, uh, um, uh, you know, the the, the uh, loadings of uh, pollutants to water water bodies using nature-based solutions. Um, um, and um, so let's let's go to next. Um, in uh, in terms of uh, nature-based solutions applied to landscapes, so these are uh, now these are 
nature-based solutions that can be implemented at locations or in, in extensive land that are used to produce food. Uh, again, you can see benefits across climate, across biodiversity, um, um, across water, soil, air. Um, and uh, we sort of, we, we, we sort of um, uh, made a tally of, of, and, and, and made a synthesis of what the existing knowledge is uh, in terms of nature-based solutions in that space. Next. Um, in terms of climate mitigation, uh, um, and, 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 and now the, um, the terminology starts getting a little bit more sophisticated. So now in addition to nature-based solutions, we can start talking about natural climate solutions. And there's a, there's a whole host of, of literature and knowledge emerging in that, in that field is how do you use nature to tackle climate change, particularly capture carbon, particularly reduce emissions, particularly go into negative emissions. And um, in, this, in this review that we did with FAO, we, we, um, uh, we did an overview of uh, how different uh, nature-based solutions are able to uh, mitigate climate emissions. Next. Um, now, in terms of the knowledge, you know, and and um, and we, so one of the things that we did going in is try to do a, a very wide literature survey, not only uh, peer-reviewed, published, academic research type, but also gray literature reports. Try to understand. Um, different experiences what we found is that you know experiences are are mixed and depending on what type of uh you know what type of nature-based solutions you're talking about is also mixed in terms of regions um but i think the consistent message here is that in in um in every part of the world and across every every type of economic activity something has been tried in terms of using nature to improve conditions and that's a that's actually a very very positive sign I think probably the challenge is to, to try to identify, and I'm going to get that into a second, is how, how can we actually make this, formalize this a little bit more, you know, and, and, and make it comparable to existing knowledge for other types of solutions that are not nature-based. Uh, next. Um, one of the things that, that, that but my very brilliant colleagues in, in financing at TNC did was trying to estimate the, you know, the, um, the gap in financing, right? So if if you if you look at uh, the global um, financing devoted to biodiversity conservation pre-COVID, you know, 2019, you know, three years ago, um, and what's needed by 2030, the gap is about to the tune of about 700 billion dollars per year, right? That's a that's an annual amount. Sounds like a lot, but this is global, so it's not a lot. It's actually very, you know, we, when you look at even individual country budgets, this is really a small drop in the bucket. Um, and uh, you know, and 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 in the in the in the gap goes in, in 2030, it goes somewhere between 700 plus to 900 plus. So let's go to the next slide to sort of break this down. Um, so the lower limit, this is the 700 plus billion dollars. Um, um, here's how sort of broken down in terms of in in terms of the uh, the types of systems that that need to be addressed. And and again, these are all um, these are all uh, uh, tackling. Um, uh, the biodiversity conservation needs in each of these landscapes and croplands, you know, the, the big, you know, big share of that is in where we grow our food, right? Um, you know, some are uh, in, in forests and fisheries and in some in urban environments and rangelands and and and, and, and the larger, the larger range is, um, it's almost a billion, you know, billion dollars. Um, um, a tr I'm sorry, almost a trillion dollars um, in, 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 you know, in terms of annual. Let's go next. Um, yeah, let's click all the way through some, you know, some of the barriers and, and, and I'm sure in this audience, uh, you know, none of this is going to be a surprise. It's, it's really, um, you know, when you look at nature-based solutions and the way they're financed, you also need to redefine how this is financed. We cannot go into try to finance nature-based solutions in the same way that we finance the traditional infrastructure, you know, water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants, um, you know, um, irrigation systems, right? It's, these are all quite different in, in terms of what they do than the nature-based solutions, even though they achieve the same objective, but the way they're structured, pumps, pipes, you know, a, um, and, uh, you know, I, I worked at IDB and, and, and uh, I, I'm sure my colleagues will under, at IDB will understand this well, you know, financing a, an infrastructure project that has pumps, pipes, you know, roads, it's 
you know, in, in, in terms of putting together the, the, the cost estimate, it's a, it's a relatively straightforward process because the information is well developed, it's well defined. We know how much it, you know, it costs to produce, you know, a kilometer of pipe of, of given size, as well as, as pumps, as well as roads, as well as irrigation systems, right? We know the we, we know the costs of energy to run these systems, um, and we can and we can be fairly um, accurate in, in in estimating outputs of you know, for example, in food production from such systems. The the knowledge is fairly well defined, right? And we you know we can work on efficiencies, but it's well defined. With nature-based solutions, that's not the case. In addition to the technical aspects, um, there are all there are a whole host of governance aspects. So um, you know when we deal with natural resources, sometimes they're transboundary, uh, many times they're transboundary. You know who pays for what, who owns. Um, you know how do you so the governance of of um, of, um, of of natural systems. These systems, every every one of these components has a solution, but but we haven't really spent the time thinking about this. We haven't really acquired the experience and knowledge that requires us to do this efficiently. So this is going to continue to be a challenge, right? So we and and again, a, a part of it is trying to come up with different frameworks to to um, to tackle this. So let's go next. Um, um, but there's some there's some positive examples. This is one one. Um, um, one um, experience um, um, that TNC has been a, been a part of the Sustainable Water Impact Fund, and and the general idea here is to uh, and, and think about think about uh, the way I like to explain it to myself um, is think about it as, as this is like a water fund on steroids, right? This is like a really major operation to protect water sources, right? But not protect them to 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 sort of have impact on a small or relatively small parcel of land. This is to protect the footprint of water on an entire ch supply chain. Um, and um, so, you know, how do you implement conservation measures in water sources that are used, for example, to grow, you know, um, peanuts in Georgia and the United States that are exported to, you know, to, to Europe or to Asia, right? Uh, how do you work on, on that scale of supply chain um, and and have a measurable impact um, protecting water sources, right? So that's um, and so we're working on this, and and uh, and the results are very promising. Uh, next, um, and then going a little bit more lower scale, this is one example of a water fund in in, in the Upper Tana, Nairobi, in Kenya, where definitely you know there are there are um, farm level uh, you know farm level uh, improvements that can be done. To protect water quality, they have a positive incidence on not only food production but also the economy, the local economies, uh, gender impacts, um, and so you actually tackle a whole host of, of of other problems that you will not be able to tackle with traditional, you know, gray infrastructure systems. Um, uh, next, um, so um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of this. We have documented uh, this work in three. Uh, reports um, uh, jointly um, written by uh, FAO and TNC that uh, in the presentation, you actually have the links directly to the documents there. Um, next. Um, and um, Oh, I had one more slide, but I'll, since it's not there, I'll um, I'll just I'll I'll just I'll, I'll just talk through it. So so one thing you know uh, one reflection that I can offer also from the knowledge standpoint is um, is the is the level um, the level of uh, training education materials that are available to look at nature based solutions. Like I, like I mentioned, it's really not the same. You know we you know I'm an engineer by training, so you know we've been studying water systems, pipes, pumps, uh, flow to porous media for you know, uh, at least a couple of centuries, right? Um, um, and uh, with nature-based solutions, we're not there. We're just starting to 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 go. And if you if you look at and I, I did this exercise this morning just before this this talk. If you if you if you try to look for in Amazon, go and look for textbooks on nature-based solutions. Okay. As of this morning, you're gonna find three. Okay, that's it. Three with you know with. Uh, if you were to say, you know, water resources systems or water management, you will get hundreds and not thousands of textbooks, right? Um, same with institutions, same with institu with educational programs, same with universities, same with research programs. The the level of, of uh, disparity is, is quite large, right? 
Um, and um, so, so I think that, you know, institutions, you know, like IDB, like FEMSA, you know, and, and, and others are part of the session. Um, uh, they have, they have the wherewithal, right. To, um, to invest in this. And, and certainly uh, being here is, is a big part of that. Um, I, I think, I think that's the future. We need to develop the knowledge. We need to develop the the expertise. We need to develop the research, right? Scientific research, not only natural, physical engineering, but also social, institutional governance uh, research that, that's gonna allow us to transition. The, the same way we're speaking about transition our energy system, right? Where everybody's talking about decarbonizing the energy transition, we will need to make a transition in water, and it, it and it and it is going to be a transition towards nature-based solutions. We need to start on that path. I think we've, I think if I had to describe it today, I think we're shyly, shyly acknowledging that this is the path, right? Um, even with sessions like this, which I love, I think we 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 need to be a, a little bit more proactive. Um, so um, I'll leave it at that. I thank you for uh, being, uh, you know, for being here today and for allowing me to. Uh, to share uh, these thoughts and reflections with you, uh, so I think we'll we'll go on to the um, to the next part of the session, which is a discussion panel. And uh, so I need to switch my hat from keynote speaker now to moderator back. <laughs> um, so welcome, Maureen, uh, Todd, and Navia. Um, uh, Maureen from um, Maureen de Belisere from HSBC. Uh, welcome, Todd Gartner from WRI. Um, great colleagues, uh, always great to work with them. And my dear Steen Navia of uh, Fosuoma from from TNC, um, and um, so let me let me throw a question out, and and you can of course um, you can of course uh, um, uh, tackle it however you want to tackle it. But you know one thing that I keep thinking about is, um, and and one thing that comes up constantly when we share. See, the issue with World Water Week is that we're almost preaching to the choir. While we're here. Everybody understands, everybody agrees this is right. But when I go and talk to people in industry or people in that, that are not necessarily connected to water, they always ask, so can you share one successful experience where someone like me and someone like me can be anything? It can be a farmer, it can be a big company, it can be someone in, in IT, it can be someone in government, right? Uh, has used this successfully. I need to see evidence. Uh, so can you share from your experience, well, from where you sit, any successful experiences in um, nature-based solutions or even valuing ecosystem services in this space? So uh, I don't know how we want to tackle it. Why don't we go in the same order that was listed? So let's start with Maureen and then move to Todd and then then Navia. Uh, yeah. So and, and again, this is just a sort of a option question, but I'm, I'm curious. Thank you very much, Fernando, and thank you very much for your presentation, which was very comprehensive and, and meets a lot of our analysis. Um, well, on the slide you presented on the financing gap, maybe something to underline is that um, uh, obviously <laughs> we, we're really not meeting the need. And when you look at where the actual financing comes from, 80% come from the public and, and private donors, meaning that the private finance is not really in yet. So I'm Marine de Basler, I'm group advisor on nat natural capital within HSBC, sitting within sustainability, representing the group in a, quite a few uh, um, external uh, initiatives such as the TNFD and specifically on nature-based solutions. I, I would uh, um, present two initiatives, one which is um, our global asset management has launched a um, joint venture along with Pollination to actually become the uh, uh, leader in uh, capital, uh, natural capital uh, investment. So it's the ambition, but looking at the ambition, we see that the pipeline is not that easy to identify. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities. There are not so many opportunities that are readily investable. And so we have uh, uh, launched another initiative along with WRI and uh, WWF, which is an NBS accelerator. And the aim is to address the barriers, I mean, for, for the wider good, for, for that pipeline to develop at scale. So if, if I um, identify one um, uh, success, I would say, I mean, we, you said we need research, we have financed 
last year a research led by Earth Security Group on mangrove. Uh, we all know that 50% of the world mangrove uh, assets are already gone and that they are critical in many ways. So th that research is on the uh, HSBC website, the Center of Sustainable Finance. Uh, it's called Financing the Earth Asset, the case, the case for mangrove as a nature-based solution. And among the findings, they have identified that um, an estimated 65 billion a year in storm and flood damage could be saved with mangrove. And that to meet that, the investment needed is roughly a little more than 10 billion. So, so you see there's a, an amazing lever here. So following that, we have uh, um, decided to work again with Earth Security Group to develop a mangrove bond framework, now applied to a specific case in the state of Queenlands, to actually um, conduct a careful analysis of the environmental economic accounting around that. And th we can already say that it is likely to be framed as an investment in climate resilience. You, you mentioned the uh, positive outcome, but uh, 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 given the relevance uh, 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 to significant assets in the Brisbane uh, city, but it's also going to include co-benefits with primary industry and blue carbon. And the idea is certainly for that bond to allow um, many investment uh, uh, support in mangrove. Thank you, Marie. This is wonderful. I, I mean, it's, um, you know, for... Um, for sort of a scientist, environmental engineer like me, when I hear someone from the banking community speaking in these terms, it tells me that we're moving in the right direction. And it tells me that we are reaching, uh, you know, the stakeholders uh, that we need to reach. So really, really interesting perspective. I appreciate you sharing it. Um, uh, Todd, uh, same, sort of same question or whatever flavor of, of interpretation you want to give to it. Great. Thank, thanks, Fernando. And, and in many ways, my example touches on some of the challenges that Maureen just laid out that so much of the funding right now is just coming from the public coffers. Um, and one of the examples that I wanna highlight is the Forest Resilience Bond uh, example that's being implemented in Northern California that's been developed by Blue Forest Conservation and the World Resources Institute. Um, and really one of the, the few examples that, that is able to bring blended capital upfront to the table both market rate capital and concessionary uh, money as well. And you, you talked about the connection between agriculture and water and NBS and energy security. And, and this project really touches on all of those things in a watershed that um, you know, is facing immense fire challenges and incredible issues with drought. Um, and ultimately the science is actually pretty clear on what we need to do to reduce some of those issues. It's to uh, do forest restoration in the form of NBS that won't necessarily totally reduce uh, the incidences of fire in the region, but it will reduce the catastrophic nature of those fires. And so if we do that NBS intervention at scale, uh, we're gonna prevent critical infrastructure from burning up we will reduce the amount of sedimentation that ends up in our reservoir, um, and we'll reduce the amount of toxic smoke that filters into our cities. In addition to all that bad stuff that we're preventing, uh, this type of restoration can actually increase water yields as well. For those that are familiar with the system, we're actually reducing the number of trees on the landscape, so the amount of water uptake by that vegetation is reduced more water in the rivers, more water in the reservoirs. Uh, the science is fairly clear. The question as you, you laid out, Fernando, who pays for it? Yes. And the key is how do you articulate a compelling business case to actors in and downstream of these watersheds and make it clear why they should be collectively part of the solution? Uh, and, and so we went about trying to put that into practice we engaged with water and hydroelectric utilities. And by doing detailed ecological assessments, risk scenarios, different fires of different um, intensities in different locations, what would that mean for them in terms of likely um, costs to treat additional water, loss of capacity in the reservoir, 
um, impacts to their filtration and piping system. And in addition, what sort of additional revenues could they be looking at if additional hydroelectric production and water supply came online? We were able to articulate tens of millions of dollars in cost avoidance and revenue generation over the next 15 to 20 year. And that has led to these water and hydroelectric utilities putting forward millions of dollars a year to be part of the solution. But it's not just the utility sector. You're also seeing this from the Fortune 500 corporate sector, right? Companies like Danone, their silk brand, the almond milk that you may have had in your coffee this morning, Target, the major retailer. On one hand, we're helping them set science-based targets for water. And then by helping them engage in projects like this, we're able to actually measure the volumetric water benefits of this restoration activity and commensurate with the level of, of, of resources they put into the project, they can capture those benefits towards meeting their targets. The final beneficiary is the actual state of California, which is really a proxy for all of the millions of residents there. And we were able to tie the outcomes and benefits of this type of project with the various goals and commitments that they have made around climate change, around public health, fire risk reduction. And when you look at the resources that the utilities, the corporate sector, and the state put in, you actually start to have enough money to implement these NBS projects at scale. And as I mentioned, we're able to get the work done pretty quickly because we're tapping into private capital upfront, driving that money to the ground. Once we hit sort of thresholds on the ground of, of levels of restoration, it unlocks repayment from these various beneficiaries. Uh, we have about $30 million that we've been able to confirm thus far, and that covers about 60,000 acres of restoration, about 25,000 hectares for those uh, using those metrics. And, and um, I know this is really a, a, a Latin America focused uh, panel. So yes, we've been able to do it in California and some people might be saying, well, California is unique and this wouldn't work other places. We just received funding to try to replicate this in Honduras and to look at how we can contextualize it to Chile. So we're really starting to see this move from idea to implementation, getting to scale, getting to replication, um, and being able to make that articulated business case on why beneficiaries should care and invest is a key part of the equation. So let me just leave it there for now, and uh, I really appreciate it, Fernando. Thank you, Todd. Great, uh, great experiences. Very, um, uh, they you know, they give us hope because you're you're actually working uh, on the ground and getting getting it done. And, and I think uh, my dear colleague, Nabia, is going to share with us something probably along uh, along the same line. So, uh, Nabia. Great. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Todd. Maureen, great to be here with you today. From the Nature Conservancy, I'm calling in from Washington, D.C. And I focus on our corporate engagement work at TNC, as well as engagement with other partners, like many of those that we have on the line today. So, I do want to share an example from Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, which we've worked with WRI on some analyses there and I'm going to share some of that information. I think it's a really great example of a lot of things that Todd and Marie mentioning, the possibilities for financial uh, investment, scaling things up, et cetera. So Sao Paulo, it's one of the biggest water systems in the world. Its watersheds have experienced some severe deforestation, which is worsening their pollution in that location, filling reservoirs more quickly with eroded soil increasing the severity of floods and droughts. Um, there were, there have been droughts recently in Brazil, in Brazil and Sao Paulo, severe water crisis that's causing a change in water consumption habits. So, you know, before the crisis, using about 4% more water than was available. After the crisis, using even more, an average of 15%. So TNC and others worked to create the Sao Paulo Water Fund, which was created in 2007. And it's really working to prove that green infrastructure can be key to improving gray infrastructure efficiency and trying to see that green gray infrastructure combination that can help to meet our water security objectives. The program is focused on restoring and conserving forested areas. Um, so tens of thousands of hectares have been restored and conserved and also implementing soil conservation practices in key agricultural areas, as well as working with the community on other challenges related to sanitation uh, and improved livelihoods. So there was a study undertaken with WRI, IUCN, Natural Capital Project, and a number of others a few years ago 
looking at what this forest restoration could do. Um, so how could natural infrastructure complement and safeguard the Cantarea water system for Sao Paulo, that's the primary water source. Um, the study found that natural infrastructure reduces soil erosion by roughly 36%, avoiding sediment pollution costs for a 28% return on investment for the water system operator. So again, that is clear evidence, an example where you can see the actual reduction of soil erosion, and that translates into a financial return. Um, so Fernando mentioned who is that stakeholder, in this case, the financial water sector, or sorry, the water sector and their financial performance. In addition, we're seeing some of those co-benefits. So the, this effort is tackling climate change, taking a million tons of carbon out of the air, and then I'll end by just sharing that corporate funding was really critical here. So we started this water fund with six corporations working together. We now have 18 companies who've committed $5.7 million. And that's also helped to leverage four new public funding sources over $16 million as well. So you're seeing that leverage and that combination of public and private funding coming together um, and trying to bring additional funding on board. So a clear example of what this can do from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'll make sure to share that study uh, in the Pathable chat so people have access to that as well. Back to you, Fernando. Thank you, Navia. And, and yes, uh, I'll reiterate that uh, all materials uh, that um, are being discussed are in are in the files tab um, of, of the Pathable, so of, of the Pathable platform. So if you want to get your hands on those, certainly those are there. Um, so this has been wonderful, um, you know, wonderful discussion. So we're going to move to the next portion of this. And, and again, we can keep the chat alive on Pathable. If you want to throw any additional questions, comments for panelists, please go ahead. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to respond to them. Um, we're going to move to the, to the next portion of this, which is the sort of the case studies, um, which I understand are going to be done through video. Is that correct? <laughs> So we have um we have our colleague uh, uh, Greg uh, Greg Brill from the Pacific Institute, uh, my dear friends uh, Carlos and Cari from the Nature Conservancy also presenting uh, case studies, as well as Luis uh, from Syria and and Anthony Panella from Chemonics International. <laughs> Institute creates and advances solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. In partnership with the UN Global Compact, we created the CO Water Mandate, an initiative that mobilizes business leaders on water, sanitation, and the sustainable development goals. I lead our work on nature-based solutions and will share some of our thinking with you today. Investments in nature-based solutions, or NBS, have not been mainstreamed primarily due to a lack of standardized approaches and tools to effectively identify and account for the potential benefits of NBS. The Pacific Institute and the Sea Water Mandate, in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy, Danone, and Limnotech, have addressed this challenge by creating a practical tool, the NBS Benefits Explorer, that helps companies and other audiences identify and account for NBS benefits. The NBS Benefits Explorer is a web-based tool developed to serve as a key starting point for organizations looking to invest in NBS and for those wishing to learn more about benefit identification and accounting. The NBS Benefits Explorer provides you with a high level overview of the types of NBS activities that can be undertaken and the resulting benefits that could accrue. Linkages between habitats, interventions, activities, processes and benefits are defined in the outputs of the tool. For example, when a specific habitat and intervention type are selected, such as forest restoration, only activities that occur within the habitat intervention category are included. The NBS Benefits Explorer also presents a variety of indicators and calculation methods that users can adopt to estimate and measure potential water, carbon, biodiversity, and socioeconomic benefits of implemented projects. After we launched the NBS Benefits Explorer in September 2021, we have seen users from over 30 countries explore the tool so we know it has global applicability. Asia Pulp and Paper is using it across their peatland restoration projects in Indonesia, 
and the Coca-Cola company is determining the stack benefits of their replenishment projects globally through our tool. We look forward to scaling up this even further with your help. Upcoming features will include benefit forecasts, spatial and temporal accrual of benefits, benefit valuation, and expanded indicators and calculation methods for benefit accounting. An exciting addition to the tool will be the inclusion of an expert interface, which will allow experts and specialists a chance to refine connections between habitats and benefits, improve benefit forecasts and valuations, and suggest additional indicators and methods for benefit accounting. The NBS Benefits Explorer can help you and your organization build the business case for NBS investments. Whether you need pre-feasibility information for NBS investors, or you need to make informed decisions regarding water security, climate mitigation and adaptation, biodiversity conservation, and socioeconomic enhancements, the NBS Benefits Explorer is your starting point for all things NBS. My name is Carlos Rogelis. I work for the Nature Conservancy. I will speak about mathematical optimization for NBS cost-effective investments in watersheds. Our main question in this research is how to optimize an NBS portfolio to achieve objectives in improving ecosystem services at the watershed scale while minimizing investment costs. Our work aims to develop a methodology for the optimization of MBS portfolios to achieve the objectives in ecosystem services associated with water, biodiversity, and carbon, while minimizing implementation and maintenance costs. I will tell you how we use this method for the analysis of MBS in the basins of the Opon, Leuvija, and Sogamoso rivers in Colombia. Using the index modeling packages for the analysis of annual water yield, seasonal water yield, sediment delivery ratio, nutrient delivery ratio, habitat quality, and carbon storage and sequestration, we quantitatively value the benefits of MBS. With these results, we integrated a multiple benefit indicator with information on MBS implementation and engineering costs to perform a spatially explicit mathematical optimization process using the R prioritizer library with the Gurobi mathematical optimization engine to define the most cost effective way to reach different benefit goals at the lowest possible cost. We apply this method in the basins of the Pon, Lebrija, and Sogamoso rivers in Colombia, obtaining results that demonstrate that the method allows obtaining optimized NDS portfolios under cost effectiveness criteria. With this analysis, it was possible to move from an initial idea of an MBS investment program to an optimized and spatially explicit action plan to enable investment conditions. The developed method combines biophysical and economic information for a watershed scale optimization process. This approach can be replicated in other geographic areas to include cost effectiveness concepts in the design of nature-based solutions portfolios. This concept is very attractive to stakeholders and the type of results obtained allows effective communication on expected benefits and required investments, including optimization and prioritization concepts. Considering the technical principles on which the method is based, it, it presents great opportunities to scale and replicate it in different exercises for portfolio construction and identification of investment opportunities. Our approach can greatly achieve a major impact on the funders of nature-based solutions, showing optimized investments to achieve higher benefits at lower costs. Hi, I'm Cara Biggerstall, Director of Water Security Science for the Nature Conservancy, and I'm here to introduce you to Waterproof. The waterproof platform was designed to address common hurdles that impede conducting pre-feasibility level return on investment assessments for nature-based solutions. For an average of thirty dollars to $50,000 in several months of time to almost no cost and results within minutes. Waterproof is free and open source, available to any user anywhere in the world to do a rapid assessment of return on investment or ROI for nature-based solution portfolio. This platform was born out of the desire to assess more quickly which water basins would benefit the most from nature-based solutions or NBS in terms of return on investment. 
so that the Nature Conservancy and its partners could prioritize where to focus the strategy and to bring this ROI calculation to potential partners and funders. In developing the platform, the team collated thousands of biophysical and financial data sets and developed dozens of cost functions related to water diversion and treatment based on peer review literature. This means that even if a user relies on the default data sets, water treatment configurations, and cost functions, the platform calculates an ROI with the best available global data and appropriate water treatment systems for the country where the assessment is taking place. The user has many options to improve on these default values, including customizing the treatment systems, cost functions, nature-based interventions, and climate change scenarios. The outputs of this platform are a series of biophysical, financial, decision-making, and geospatial results that help the user determine whether nature-based solutions can provide a positive return on investment for addressing water security issues and an indication of what the appropriate portfolio of interventions looks like. The platform launched in December 2021, and the team is now focused on collaborating with users on applying the platform in cases around the world. There are already several cases uploaded into the platform from users who chose to make their cases public, and many more will become available in the coming months. Right now, we are offering pro bono help to a limited number of cases, and if you're interested, please feel free to reach out. This platform has the potential to serve as a powerful tool for prioritizing locations and engagements of partners and funders of NBS for water security. This is critical for more rapidly scaling of nature-based solutions for water, delivering on clean water and co-benefits for people in nature in basins across the globe. My name is Louise Walker and I'm Senior Research Manager for their water theme with Syria, which is the UK's Construction Industry Research and Information Association. We are all aware of the urgent need for greater use of nature-based solutions. The tool I'm going to talk about is innovative in providing a practical way to include such projects to existing decision-making processes. The Benefits Estimation Tool, BEST, is a spatial online application which supports the evaluation of multiple benefits of nature-based solutions. Its main goal is to enable robust business cases, to give confidence to decision makers in the value of such projects to society, the environment and the economy. Sometimes benefits are dependent on complicated processes. BEST helps clarify those by defining the interventions, how they will work and what they will change and by how much and quantifying the benefits they will deliver. This map-based tool enables the user to visualize the location of a project and guides them through the assessment process, drawing on up-to-date information on over 50 financial, social and environmental benefits. Over 700 sources of literature and data sets have been consistently reviewed for use within the estimations, saving time and providing a consistent, reliable and comparable process. Vast amounts of information have been processed, so practitioners don't need to. The distribution of benefits of a project across the capitals framework is displayed within downloadable report-ready outputs along with estimated monetary values within confidence limits. BEST has been in development for over 10 years, starting as a spreadsheet tool, which has been updated and improved over time. It is now available as an online application. BEST was developed collaboratively by Syria, Stantec, EcoFutures, and a project steering group of over 30 industry professionals. BEST was used to evaluate an urban retrofit project in Wales' capital city, Cardiff, which provided 1,700 metres squared of additional green space, 495 metres squared of permeable surfacing, and 127 new trees. It removed 42,000 metres squared of surface water runoff from combined sewers and provided habitats, biodiversity, and an improved urban space with traffic calming and cycleways. Best was used to estimate health, recreation, air quality, carbon and amenity enhancement. 
the estimated benefits was over 8.4 million over a 30 year period with a maximum payback time of 12 and a half years. Best have been downloaded by over 1,500 individuals since 2015, both nationally and internationally. The new geospatial platform allows easier visualization of the location and boundary of a project, inclusion of spatial GIS data, faster data input, and creation of sub-project areas. BEST provides the means to conduct a structured, auditable analysis of the baseline situation against a range of benefits a project might bring. It aids project communication and it, its outputs are downloadable for use in reports, presentation and, and business cases. It provides a practical way of encouraging the much needed wider use of nature-based solutions by demonstrating their worth. BEST can be used by anyone involved in nature-based solution projects. It can be adapted for particular sectors and we plan to translate it for use in different countries. To learn more, I invite you to visit sustrain.org slash resources slash BEST where more information will be coming soon. Thank you. <laughs> a program director with Commonics International. And I'd like to tell you about the work we did through the Severe Support Activity to help USAID, NASA, and the entire Severe Global Network systematize its approach to developing locally driven, inclusive geospatial services. NASA has this constellation of satellites spinning around us all the time, collecting vast amounts of Earth observation data. And through a partnership with USAID, Severe's goal is to put that to practical use by co-developing services with local partners that will make a development impact. With SEVERE, USAID and NASA use satellite data and geospatial technology to improve resilience and sustainable resource management at local, national, and regional scales. And they do this by co-developing cutting-edge services through a global network of five regional hubs that monitor local challenges related to climate change. However, with such a broad network, we identify the need to harmonize service planning approaches, terminologies, and processes to provide guidance to ensure that women and other marginalized groups are realizing equal benefits from SEVERE's geospatial services. To that end, Commonics supported SEVERE to co-develop the Service Planning Toolkit, a comprehensive guide that outlines the approach and provides concrete tools and methodologies to develop demand-driven services that are responsive to local needs. The toolkit has four tools that are designed to be used in an iterative way. That means revisiting the different stages of planning to refine their approach is both expected and encouraged. SEVERE starts with identifying the need and desired impact through a collaborative process. First, SEVERE identifies the various stakeholders and government partners through a consultation and needs assessment. Then they map these stakeholders to learn how they work together, interact, and how decisions are made. Then, working through a collaborative process, they develop a strong design that outlines the geospatial products and data that will be produced. And finally, mechanisms for tracking progress. Here we use monitoring, evaluation, and learning to create, collect, and report on relevant performance indicators and nurture a culture of asking challenging questions and having evidence to support responses, all of which comprise our holistic service planning approach, which is outlined in great detail in our SEVERE service planning toolkit, open to all on SEVERE's website, severeglobal.net. SEVERE has been implementing this approach since 2017 and has used it to co-develop more than 45 services around the world, engaging hundreds of colleagues and thousands of stakeholders. And since we're here at World Water Week, it's worth mentioning that 12 of those services fall under our water and related disasters thematic area, providing services to improve resilience and reduce risk of extreme hydrological events, like providing advanced flood forecasting in the Mekong River Basin, and also to help manage precious water resources, like mapping and monitoring Himalayan glaciers, and providing critical information on surface water availability in West Africa, to name a few examples. It is our hope that sharing this approach with you will give you ideas for supporting your current or future work to make it more responsive to user needs and more inclusive of users as well as the communities impacted. To learn more, I invite you to visit severeglobal.net. Thanks. <laughs>
Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you all. This was, um, these were all great experiences. Um, and, and each one of them, um, I, I was, as I was listening and, and watching, um, you know, it, it's, um, you know, Greg walked us through the Benefits Explorer. Um, Carlos did some very nifty mathematical modeling. Love it, by the way, Carlos. Um, Kari focused on um, on, a, on a water on, on a water rapid assessment of ROI. Um, um, Louise talked to us about, about, about a benefits estimation. Now, Tom, uh, Tom, uh, Tony uh, walked us through um, the, this um, severe USAID NASA toolkit. So. So, so this is this is my question, and 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 um, um, and, and, I, and I think it, it it can lead to a provocative discussion, and and we don't have unlimited time, but I think we have time to tackle this a, li a, a little bit initially. So, if 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 I'm if I'm a um, someone that doesn't know a whole lot about nature-based solutions, and you know, it could be someone in industry, you know, with a lot of influence, it could be a farmer, it could be a water utility operator. So how do how do I walk through this maze of tools that are available? What what tool is right for me? Where do I start? I mean, I want to hear some reflections on very important developments, very great uh, tools uh, that for the sophisticated user make a lot of sense. But I, I want to tackle the non-sophisticated user. I want to tackle. I want to bring. I want to enlarge the circle. So um, this question is for all the panels. So feel free to um, to jump in with your comments. Uh, Fernando, I thought I'd, I'd jump in as uh, not only because I was the, the first presenter on, on the video series, but also because, as I mentioned in the video, uh, the NBS Benefits Explorer is a really great place to start. And, and I certainly don't want to toot the horn of the tool uh, explicitly, um, but it really it, it is it's very practical and very intuitive. So for those that don't know where to start, come and come and check out the Benefits Explorer. It's a stepwise process, and whether you are a beginner or you really want to try and understand what the stack benefits look like across your water replenishment projects or your restoration projects, it gives a general overview of the kinds of benefits that can accrue uh, within an NBS project. As I also mentioned in the video as well, we, we're adding more functionality in the coming months, so within the next six months or so, um, and we're really in the weeds with, uh, with figuring out some, some benefit forecasts. So projecting how these benefits accrue uh, over different spatial and temporal scales as well. So it really starts building the business case for nature-based solutions, again, for those that don't know where to start, that are completely confounded by what NBS even is or, or the kinds of benefits that accrue, and then also some valuation. Um, I was really inspired by the other work that is happening in the space, and I've made so many notes from connecting the dots as well, um, between some of the NASA work, between what Louise is doing, and um, we work very closely with TNC colleagues as well. So Waterproof is a really great addition to what we're doing. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. Anyone else want to chime in? I'll just I'll just jump in really quick, Fernando. Um, thanks for the question. I think it's really important. It, it's fantastic. And thanks for the invitation to be here and, and um, share Waterproof, but to also hear about these other tools and efforts, um, because I think they're all really valuable in helping to um, to address some of the barriers that we have in, in scaling nature-based solutions. Um, in, in terms of how to kind of understand where um, the different tools and efforts um, sort of along the project pipeline, but also I think it's important to think about the scale. So for example, the NBS Benefits Explorer is a really a great tool when you're looking at your uh, project scale, whereas Waterproof is looking at the, the watershed scale um, and looking at a combination of projects. Um, in terms of Waterproof in, 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 um, in sort of the project pipeline, the intention is to use it at the pre-feasibility phase. So when you're trying to understand what, is there a positive return on investment in this watershed? Is it worth pursuing a set of nature-based solutions to address the water challenges? That's when you would use Waterproof to kind of get that understanding. Or if you're looking across a number of sites and trying to prioritize which ones have the highest ROI, then you would you could use Waterproof to do that. Fantastic. Thank you, Kari. Um, any other reactions? Because I do have another question. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to add, Fernando, that probably as, as Kari was mentioning, uh, all is about the, the detail that you need and the phase that you are in, in terms of the of the things that you are developing for a watershed investment program, right? So probably a tool like Waterproof is it focuses on pre-feasibility and a watershed scale. 
but it, for example, you, you want to advance in a design, you need different tools and uh, tools with more detail uh, that can bring better response and to reduce also uncertainty, right? Uh, that's quite important if you want to look for money to for the investments in, in nature-based solutions. So in our experience, yeah, looking at, for example, the optimization in terms of a detailed design with detailed modeling and uh, looking at uh, at, the, at the improvement of the of the investment in terms of maximize the 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 benefit that you can get from an investment could be a good option but just when you need it right because it's a lot of effort just to do that kind of things and probably at the beginning the questions can be simpler so you can go with a simpler uh, tool just to look at the answer of the question so I just wanted to mention that great. Great, great. Let me let me complement that question with another little bit of also reflection question. Um, uh, you know, and, and I'll and I'll put my hat now as academic to 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 be in character here. You know, um, one of the to, to me one of the one of the key limitations of 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 how nature based solutions can be rolled up quicker. Right. I don't think it's going to be technology. I think technology is going to catch up there quickly. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be advocacy or, or well intentions. I think I think there's plenty of us to go around to do this, right? I do think in order to we need to reach a massive number of people, right? Um, and in order to reach a number massive a number a massive number of people, I do think that we need to educationally institutionalize nature-based solutions into into educational curricula, right? And, and that goes not only university, right, but also you know all the way back back to to elementary education, and, and 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 I know there's some efforts in that space, but but I can tell you that in academia, if you were to do a survey, this is worldwide, not just United States, worldwide. I've done this. Look at classes, programs on nature-based that include nature-based solutions in one way or the other. You're not going to find a lot, right? It's the same with the textbooks, right? There's there's just not much there. I think that's going to be a big barrier, right? Um, and um, so I wonder what your thoughts are collectively or individually on this, and if you know if if your you or your organizations will be willing to chip in in an effort because I don't think we want to do I I can't do this at George Mason by myself. It's not going to happen. I, but but if I found you know twenty other universities around the world that wanted to do this, then then we can get make make a, a go quicker on it. So so what are your what are your thoughts on something like this? Thoughts and or interest. I don't want to dominate, but I just want to make one point. Yeah, yeah I'm really, um, I really think this is a really important change that needs to happen. And uh, my background is in engineering. Um, I'm a, sort of a professional engineer, civil engineer. And um, engineers, are, I think that, engineers are the worst. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the areas where we need to work is with this, the certification of engineers and, the edu and which, which includes requirements of um, education where this should be, um, it'd be great to be able to integrate um, knowledge and um, capacity around nature-based solutions as, as part of that, that educational requirement. Um, so I, I would love to see better integration into the engineering education around nature-based solutions. I, I am also an engineer, so I was thinking as, in the same way as, as Carrie, and probably the concept, the general concept of working with nature could be a, a very good effort for the academia, you know, in, in, in terms, for example, in the in engineering programs. And uh, probably it's, it's good to have that kind of vision because we cannot work and do development without thinking about the nature and, uh, and how well can we just uh, complement the things that we are doing with the process that nature is doing, especially in rivers and wetlands. So, that kind of things from the academia component could be very valuable and uh, can bring a lot of benefits in terms of the development in, in different countries and in different parts of the world. Thank you, Carlos. Um, Marine, Luis, I want to hear from the other side of the pond. Yeah, what, exactly. What's your take on this from the European side? Yeah, I, I, I was going to um, uh, jump in, actually. Uh, certainly, we need uh, enhanced um, curriculum in universities, but I would think also in business school, certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in corporates, uh, um, when looking at the main barriers to 
develop NBS at scale. I mean, we have conducted a, a few um, research with South Pole, with Terranomics, and um, it's certainly around metrics, but not only, it's also about an entrepreneurial mindset around developing NBS. And yep. that entrepreneurial man mindset is also something that you acquire in business school or in the private sector. And, and on the financial side, what I see also um, uh, within HSBC, and I could elaborate for, for uh, uh, hours on that, is that um, because of the many uh, complexity around that, the perceived um, return on investment is low. So meaning developing skills for um, the, the financial industry is also key to develop that uh, sector at scale. So really, it's, it's not only about engineering, it's also about uh, the, the entire ecosystem. Wonderful. And Nick, can I chime in very quickly as well with what Marina and Corey mentioned too, around bringing sectors and different players around the table. Um, I'm working very closely with a number of um, academic institutions in, within our expert advisor group for the benefits project that TNC and Pacific Institute and other players are working on. And what we're seeing is that NBS was pretty much a nascent term over the last 10 years. It had different terminologies and different names. We've seen ecosystem-based adaptation, we've seen restoration, conservation, etc. So maybe a lot of different things fell under the umbrella of NBS, but weren't necessarily termed NBS. But there's a really big thrust now towards implementing NBS in policy and practice. I mean, that's a key um, focus area that we need to work here, is, is operationalizing the term of NBS taking it out of necessarily an ecosystem service framework, but into something that's very practical and operational. What we're also seeing is the inclusion of a very diverse group of stakeholders around the NBS decision-making table. Um, there's a, a professor at, at the University of Victoria in Canada that's working very closely with indigenous communities, trying to bring in that indigenous knowledge around the table for, for NBS and, and really driving that process forward. So I think whether we use the engineering example from Carlos and, and Kari here saying, how do we formulate that language and integrate it there versus bringing in traditional knowledge and local communities into decision-making, I think we really need to drive this process going forward. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, that it needs to be uh, stronger in, uh, during training, uh, I think uh, academic training can be a bit siloed. I know uh, years ago um, at the University of Sheffield in the final year of the master's students, we used to get um, different uh, subjects together to work on an actual case study. So we had um, engineers, ecologists, um, architects, maybe people from business studies to work together on a, on a a sustainability project as it was then but given that that's how we have to work in the real world it's a shame that there's not more training done on that before um, graduates are launched into the real world so that they can have their arguments about um, you know the benefits of the grey versus the green um, infrastructure approach before they actually do it for real in, so, um, yeah, I think it, it would be good to to embed that kind of thinking and that really strong collaboration. And as you say, taking into account um, community value and indigenous value as well into that. It's really important. Wonderful. Uh, no, this has been a great discussion and we can go on for hours, as you can say, as you can tell. Fortunately, we don't have that amount of time. Um, uh, but definitely very, very provocative conversation. I want to thank the panelists uh, for, for your thoughts and for, for your contributions, um, as well as, as everyone. Certainly, we have uh, lots of work to do, right? Um, and, uh, but it's great to see the progress. It's great to see these tools. It's great to see the thinking advancing uh, towards meeting these goals. Um, so um, I'm going to segue into, into the closing remarks that are going to be given by my Another great dear friend, Carlos Hurtado from Fundación FEMSA. Uh, for the closing, Carlos, um, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fernando, and what a great conversation. It is very encouraging to see the number of tools and opportunities we have to scale and implement MBS around the globe. Fernando spoke of the great potential they have in terms of climate change mitigation. 
However, he also spoke of the significant gap in financing and the barriers we usually encounter in achieving the required funding. One of those barriers is the complexity of the repayment mechanisms. Throughout the session, we also review various tools that have been developed to help us value MBS, making it easier to, to build a business case, fostering more investment. It is difficult to summarize what we have seen in a couple of minutes, but I hope that this session has not only been interesting, but has inspired you to act. The session aimed to showcase these tools and promote their adoption beyond the specific cases shown so that MBAs can be deployed at the scale we need to thrive. We also wanted to spark a discussion around the opportunities we have. From our perspective, the gap between the opportunities offered by MBS and the investment available, as well as the pace of implementation, is still very big. We need to think outside the box and make high-risk bets. Investing in monitoring, making it cheaper, more reliable, is key to foster investments, especially to make the case of MBS as a viable alternative to traditional projects. On Fundacion FEMSA, we are making these bets, investing in technology, methodologies, and financial mechanisms, as we believe they can help achieve the scale needed to face the challenges our region and the world have. We invite you to join these or other efforts and share your experience. Thanks to the audience and the panelists for a great discussion that we encourage everybody to continue to be a part of. And now I will go back to Fernando so you can close us off. Yes. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Um, so you know, if you if you follow the chat on on Pathable, you know there, there's you know lots of interesting exchanges there. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the contributors, everybody that that uh, provided a question or a comment for enriching the contents of this session. Um, and then finally, you know, um, last but not least, I, I really want to thank um, the conveners, right, of the session, the the people that made this session possible. This very interesting discussion. Uh, the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, um, uh, FEMSA Foundation, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the Stockholm International Water Institute. Thank you all uh, for such a delightful session. Um, and uh, I have a feeling we're going to keep seeing each other in Stockholm and World Water Week. So this is only not, not a goodbye. This is just a so long. Bye-bye, uh, well, everybody, and, uh, and thanks again. Thank you.